on The Soul and the Resurrection, translated by William Moore and Henry Austin Wilson. Basil, great among the saints, had departed from this life to God, and the impulse to mourn for him was shared by all the churches. But his sister, the teacher, was still living, and so I journeyed to her, yearning for an interchange of sympathy over the loss of her brother. My soul was truly sorrow-stricken by this grievous blow, and I sought for one who could feel it equally to mingle my tears with. But when we were in each other's presence, the sight of the teacher awakened all my pain, for she too was lying in a state of prostration, even unto death. Well, she gave in to me for a while, like a skillful driver, in the ungovernable violence of my grief. And then she tried to check me by speaking, and to correct with the curb of her reasonings the disorder of my soul. She quoted the Apostle's words about the duty of not being grieved for them that sleep, because only men without hope have such feelings. With a heart still fermenting with my pain, I asked, How can that ever be practiced by mankind? There is such an instinctive and deep-seated abhorrence of death in everyone. Those who look on a deathbed can hardly bear the sight. And those whom death approaches recoil from him all they can. Why, even the law that controls us puts death highest on the list of crimes and highest on the list of punishments. By what device, then, can we bring ourselves to regard as nothing a departure from life, even in the case of a stranger, not to mention that of relations, when so be they cease to live? We see before us the whole course of human life aiming at this one thing, how we may continue in this life. Indeed, it is for this that houses have been invented for us to live in, in order that our bodies may not be prostrated in their environment by cold or heat. Agriculture? Again, what is it but the providing of our sustenance? In fact, all thought about how we are to go on living is occasioned by the fear of dying. Why is medicine so honored among men? Because it is thought to carry on the combat with death, to a certain extent, by its methods. Why do we have corslets and long shields and greaves and helmets and all the defensive armor, and enclosures of fortifications and iron-barred gates, except that we fear to die? Death, then, being naturally so terrible to us, how can it be easy for a survivor to obey this command, to remain unmoved by friends departed? Why, what is the special pain you feel, asked the teacher, in the mere necessity itself of dying? This common talk of unthinking persons is no sufficient accusation. What? Is there no occasion for grieving? I replied to her. When we see one who so lately lived and spoke, becoming all of a sudden lifeless and motionless, with the sense of every bodily organ extinct, with no sight or hearing in operation, or any other faculty of apprehension that sense possesses. And if you apply fire or steel to him, even if you were to plunge a sword into the body, or cast it to the beasts of prey, or bury it underneath a mound, that dead man is alike unmoved at any treatment. Seeing then that this change is observed in all these ways, and that principle of life, whatever it might be, disappears all at once out of sight, as the flame of an extinguished lamp which burnt on it the moment before neither remains upon the wick nor passes to any other place, but completely disappears. How can such a change be born without emotion by one who has no clear ground to rest upon? 
We hear the departure of the spirit. We see the shell that is left. But of the part that has been separated, we are ignorant, both as to its nature and as to the place where it has fled. For neither earth, nor air, nor water, nor any other element can show as residing within itself this force that has left the body, at whose withdrawal a, only a corpse remains, ready for dissolution. While I was thus enlarging upon the subject, the teacher signed to me with her hand and said, Surely, what alarms and disturbs your mind is not the thought that the soul, instead of lasting forever, ceases with the body's dissolution. I answered rather audaciously, and without due consideration of what I said, for my passionate grief had not yet given me back my judgment. In fact, I said that the divine utterances seemed to me like mere commands compelling us to believe that the soul lasts forever. Not, however, that we were led by them to this belief by any reasoning. Our mind within us appears slavishly to accept the opinion enforced, but not to acquiesce with a spontaneous impulse. Hence, our sorrow over the departed is all the more grievous. We do not exactly know whether this vivifying principle is anything by itself. Where it is, how it is, whether in fact it exists in any way at all, anywhere. This uncertainty about the real state of the case balances the opinions on either side. Many adopt the one view, many the other. And indeed, there are certain persons of no small philosophical reputation among the Greeks who have held and maintained this which I have just said. Away, she cried, with that pagan nonsense. For therein, the inventor of lies fabricates only false theories to harm the truth. Observe this and nothing else, that such a view about the soul amounts to nothing less than the abandonment of virtue and seeking the pleasure of the moment only. The life of eternity, by which alone virtue claims the advantage, must be despaired of. And pray how, I asked, are we to get a firm and unmovable belief in the soul's continuance? I too am sensible of the fact that human life will be bereft of the most beautiful ornament which life has to give, I mean virtue, unless an undoubting confidence with regard to this be established within us. What indeed does virtue have to stand upon in the case of those persons who conceive of this present life as the limit of their existence, and who hope for nothing beyond? Well, replied the teacher, we must seek where we may get a beginning for our discussion upon this point. And if you please, let the defense of the opposing views be undertaken by yourself. For I see that your mind is a little inclined to accept such a brief. Then, after the conflicting belief has been stated, we shall be able to look for the truth. When she made this request, and I had deprecated the suspicion that I was making the objections in real earnest, instead of only wishing to get a firm ground for the belief about the soul, by calling into court first what is aimed against this view, I began. Would not the defenders of the opposite belief say this, that the body, being composite, must necessarily be resolved into that of which it is composed? And when the coalition of elements in the body ceases, each of those elements naturally gravitates toward its kindred element with the irresistible bias of like to like. The heat in us will thus unite with heat, the earthy with the solid, and each of the other elements also will pass toward its like. 
Where then will the soul be after that? If one affirm that it is in those elements, one will be obliged to admit that it is identical with them. For this fusion could not possibly take place between two things of different natures. But this being granted, the soul must necessarily be viewed as a complex thing, fused as it is with qualities so opposite. But the complex is not simple and must be classed with the composite. And the composite is necessarily dissoluble. And dissolution means the destruction of the compound. And the destructible is not immortal, else the flesh itself, resolvable as it is into its constituent elements, might so be called immortal. If, on the other hand, the soul is something other than these elements, where can our reason suggest a place for it to be? When it is thus, by virtue of its alien nature, not to be discovered in these elements, and there is no other place in the world either where it may continue, in harmony with its own peculiar character, to exist. But if a thing can be found nowhere, plainly it has no existence. Teacher sighed gently at these words of mine, and then said, Maybe these were the objections, or such as these, that the Stoics and Epicureans collected at Athens made in answer to the Apostle. I hear that Epicurus carried his theories in this very direction. The framework of things was, to his mind, a fortuitous and mechanical affair, without a providence penetrating its operations. And as a piece with this, he thought that human life was like a bubble, existing only as long as the breath within was held in by the enveloping substance. Inasmuch as our body was a mere membrane, as it were, encompassing a breath, and that on the collapse of the inflation, the imprisoned essence was extinguished. To him, the visible was the limit of existence. He made our senses the only means of our apprehension of things. He completely closed the eyes of his soul and was incapable of seeing anything in the intelligible and immaterial world. Just as a man who is imprisoned in a cabin, whose walls and roof obstruct the view outside, remains without a glimpse of all the wonders in the sky. Verily, everything in the universe that is seen to be an object of sense is like an earthen wall, forming in itself a barrier between the narrower souls and that intelligible world which is ready for their contemplation. And it is the earth and water and fire alone that such behold. Whence comes each of these elements, in what and by what they are encompassed? Such souls, because of their narrowness, cannot detect. While the sight of a garment suggests to anyone the weaver of it, and the thought of the shipwright comes at the side of the ship, and the hand of the builder is brought to the mind of him who sees the building. These little souls gaze upon the world, but their eyes are blind to him whom all this that we see around us makes manifest. And so they propound their clever and pungent doctrines about the soul's vanishment body from elements, and elements from body, and besides, the impossibility of the soul's self-existence if it is not to be one of these elements or lodged in one. For if these opponents suppose that by virtue of the soul not being akin to the elements, it is nowhere after death, they must propound to begin with the absence of the soul from fleshly life as well, seeing that the body itself is nothing but a concourse of those elements. 
And so they must not tell us that the soul is to be found there either, independently vivifying their compound. If it is not possible for the soul to exist after death, though the elements do, then I say, according to this teaching, our life as well is proved to be nothing else but death. But if, on the other hand, they do not make the existence of the soul now in the body a question for doubt, how can they maintain its evanishment when the body is resolved into its elements? Then, secondly, they must employ an equal audacity against the God in this nature, too. For how can they assert that the intelligible and immaterial unseen can be dissolved and diffused into the wet and the soft, as also into the hot and the dry, and so hold together the universe in existence through being, though not of a kindred nature with the things which it penetrates, yet not thereby incapable of so penetrating them? Let them, therefore, remove from their system the very deity who upholds the world. This is the very point, I said, upon which our adversaries cannot fail to have doubts, viz. that all things depend on God and are encompassed by Him, or that there is any divinity at all transcending the physical world. It would be more fitting she cried, to be silent about such doubts, and not deign to make any answer to such foolish and wicked propositions. For there is a divine precept forbidding us to answer a fool in his folly. And he must be a fool, as the prophet declares, who says that there is no God. But since one needs must speak... I will urge upon you an argument which is not mine, nor that of any human being, for it would then be of small value whoever spoke it, but an argument which the whole creation enunciates by the medium of its wonders to the audience of the eye, with a skillful and artistic utterance that reaches the heart. Creation proclaims outright the Creator. For the very heavens, as the prophet says, declare the glory of God with their unutterable words. We see the universal harmony in the wondrous sky and on the wondrous earth. How elements essentially opposed to each other are all woven together in an ineffable union to serve one common end each contributing its particular force to maintain the whole. How the unmingling and mutually repellent do not fly apart from each other by virtue of their peculiarities, any more than they are destroyed when compounded by such contrariety. How those elements which are naturally buoyant move downwards, the heat of the sun, for instance, descending in its rays, while the bodies which possess weight are lifted by becoming rarefied in vapor, so that water, contrary to its nature, ascends, being conveyed through the air to the upper regions. How, too, that fire of the firmament so penetrates the earth that even its abysses feel the heat. How the moisture of the rain infused into the soil generates one though it be by nature, myriads of differing seeds, and animates in due proportion each subject of its influence. How very swiftly the polar sphere revolves, how the orbits within it move the contrary way, with all the eclipses and conjunctions and measured intervals of the planets. We see all this with the piercing eyes of the mind, nor can we fail to be taught by means of such a spectacle that the divine power, working with skill and method, is manifesting itself in this actual world and penetrating each portion, 
combines those portions with the whole, and completes the whole by the portions, and encompasses the universe with a single all-controlling force, self-centered and self-contained, never ceasing from its motion, yet never altering the position which it holds. And pray how, I asked, does this belief in the existence of God prove, along with it, the existence of the human soul? For God, surely, is not the same thing as the soul, so that if one were believed in, the other must necessarily be believed in. She replied, It has been said by wise men that man is a little world in himself and contains all the elements which go to complete the universe. If this view is a true one, and so it seems, perhaps we shall need no other ally than it to establish the truth of our conception of the soul. And our conception of it is this, that it exists with a rare and peculiar nature of its own, independent of the body with its gross texture. We get our exact knowledge of this outer world from the apprehension of our senses, and these sensational operations themselves lead us on to the understanding of the supersensual world of fact and thought. And our eye thus becomes the interpreter of that almighty wisdom which is visible in the universe, and points in itself to the being who encompasses it. Just so, when we look to our inner world, we find no slight grounds there also in the known for conjecturing the unknown. And the unknown there also is that which, being the object of thought and not of sight, eludes the grasp of sense. I rejoined, Nay, it may be very possible to infer a wisdom transcending the universe from the skillful and artistic designs observable in this harmonized fabric of physical nature, but, as regards the soul, what knowledge is possible to those who would trace from any indications the body has to give the unknown through the known? Most certainly, the Virgin replied, to those who wish to follow the wise proverb and know themselves, the soul herself is a competent instructress. Of the fact, I mean, that she is an immaterial and spiritual thing, working and moving in a way corresponding to her peculiar nature, and evincing these peculiar emotions through the organs of the body. For this bodily organization exists the same even in those who have just been reduced by death to the state of corpses. But it remains without motion or action, because the force of the soul is no longer in it. It moves only when there is sensation in the organs, and not only that, but the mental force by means of that sensation penetrates with its own impulses and moves whither it will all those organs of sensation. What then, I asked, is the soul? Perhaps there may be some possible means of delineating its nature, so that we may have some comprehension of this subject in the way of a sketch. Its definition, the teacher replied, has been attempted in different ways by different writers, each according to his own bent. But the following is our opinion about it. The soul is an essence, created and living and intellectual, transmitting from itself to an organized and sentient body the power of living and of grasping objects of sense. As long as a natural constitution capable of this holds together. Saying this, she pointed to the physician who was sitting to watch her state, and said, There is a proof of what I say close by us. How, I ask, does this man, by putting his fingers to feel the pulse, 
hear, in a manner, through this sense of touch, nature calling loudly to him and telling him of her peculiar pain. In fact, that the disease in the body is an inflammatory one, and that the malady originates in this or that internal organ, and that there is such and such a degree of fever. How, too, is he taught by the agency of the eye other facts of this kind, when he looks to see the posture of the patient and watches the wasting of the flesh? As, too, the state of the complexion, pale somewhat and bilious, and the gaze of the eyes, as is the case with those in pain, involuntarily inclining to sadness, indicate the internal condition. So the ear gives information of the like, ascertaining the nature of the malady by the shortness of the breathing, and by the groan that comes with it. <clears throat> One might say that even the sense of smell in the expert is not incapable of detecting the kind of disorder, but that it notices the secret suffering of the vitals in the particular quality of the breath. Could this be so if there were not a certain force of intelligence present in each organ of the senses? What would our hand have taught us of itself without thought conducting it from feeling? to understanding the subject before it? What would the ear as separate from mind, or the eye, or the nostril, or any other organ, have helped toward the settling of the question all by themselves? Verily, it is most true what one of heathen culture is recorded to have said, that it is the mind that sees and the mind that hears. Else, if you will not allow this to be true, you must tell me why when you look at the sun, as you have been trained by your instructor to look at him, you assert that he is not in the breadth of his disk, the size he appears to the many, but that he exceeds by many times the measure of the entire earth. Do you not confidently maintain that it is so, because you have arrived by reasoning through phenomena at the conception of such and such a movement, of distances of such and such of time and space, of such causes of eclipse. And when you look at the waxing and waning moon, you are taught other truths by the visible figure of that heavenly body, that it is itself devoid of life, and that it revolves in the circle nearest the earth, and that it is lit by light from the sun, just as is the case with mirrors, which receiving the sun upon them do not reflect rays of their own but those of the sun, whose light is given back from their smooth flashing surface. Those who see this but do not examine it think that the light comes from the moon herself, but that this is not the case is proved by this, that when she is diametrically facing the sun, she has the whole of the disk that looks our way illuminated. But as she traverses her own circle of revolution quicker from moving in a narrower space, she herself has completed this more than twelve times before the sun has once traveled round his, whence it happens that her substance is not always covered by flight, for her position facing him is not maintained in the frequency of her revolutions. But while this position causes the whole side of the moon which looks to us to be illumined, directly she moves sideways her hemisphere which is turned to us necessarily becomes partially shadowed, and only that which is turned to him meets his embracing rays. The brightness, in fact, keeps on retiring from that which can no longer see the sun to that which still sees him, until she passes right across the sun's disk and receives his rays upon her hinder part. And then the fact of her being in herself totally devoid of light and splendor causes the side turned to us to be invisible, while the further hemisphere is all in light. And this is called the completion of her waning. 
but when again in her own revolution she has passed the sun and she is transverse to his rays, the side which was dark just before begins to shine a little, for the rays move from this illumined part to that so lately invisible. You see what the eye does teach, and yet it would never of itself have afforded this insight without something that looks through the eyes and uses the data of the senses as mere guides to penetrate from the apparent to the unseen. It is needless to add the methods of geometry that lead us step by step through visible delineations to truths which lie out of sight, and countless other instances which all prove that apprehension is the work of an intellectual essence deeply seated in our nature, acting through the operation of our bodily senses. But what, I asked, if insisting on the great differences which in spite of a certain quality of matter shared alike by all elements in their visible form, exist between each particular kind of matter. Motion, for instance, is not the same in all, some moving up, some down, nor form, nor quality either. If someone were to say that there was in the same manner incorporated in or belonging to these elements, a certain force as well, which affects these intellectual insights and operations by a purely natural effort of their own, such effects, for instance, as we often see produced by the mechanists, in whose hands matter, combined according to the rules of art, thereby imitates nature exhibiting resemblance not in figure alone, but even in motion, so that when the piece of mechanism sounds in its resonant part, it mimics a human voice, without, however, our being able to perceive anywhere any mental force working out the particular figure or character, sound, and movement. Suppose, I say, we were to affirm that all this was produced as well in the organic machine of our own natural bodies without any intermixture of a special thinking substance but owing simply to an inherent motive power of the elements within us accomplishing by itself these operations to nothing else in fact but an impulsive movement working for the cognition of the object before us. Would not then the fact stand proved of the absolute non-existence of that intellectual and impalpable being, the soul, which you talk of? Your instance, she replied, and your reasoning upon it, though belonging to the counter-argument, may both of them be made allies of our statement, and will contribute not a little to the confirmation of its truth. Why, how can you say that? Because, you see, so to understand, manipulate, and dispose the soulless matter, that the art which is stored away in such mechanisms becomes almost like a soul to the material. In all the various ways in which it mocks movement, in figure and voice and so on, may be turned into a proof of there being something in man whereby he shows an innate fitness to think out within himself, through the contemplative and inventive faculties, such thoughts, and having prepared such mechanisms in theory to put them into practice by manual skill and exhibit in matter the product of his mind. First, for instance, he saw by dint of thinking that to produce any sound there is need of some wind, and then with a view to produce wind in the mechanism, he previously ascertained by a course of reasoning and close observation of the nature of elements that there is no vacuum at all in the world, but that the lighter is to be considered a vacuum only by comparison with the heavier seeing that the air itself taken as a separate subsistence is crowded quite full. 
it is by an abuse of language that a jar is said to be empty, for when it is empty of any liquid, it is nonetheless, even in this state, full to the eyes of the experienced. A proof of this is that a jar, when put into a pool of water, is not immediately filled, but at first floats on the surface, because the air it contains helps to buoy up its rounded sides, till at last the hand of the drawer of the water forces it down to the bottom, and when there it takes in water by its neck, during which process it is shown not to have been empty even before the water came, for there is the spectacle of a sort of combat going on in the neck between the two elements the water being forced by its weight into the interior and therefore streaming in, the imprisoned air on the other hand being straightened for room by the gush of water along the neck, and so rushing in the contrary direction. Thus the water is checked by the strong current of air and gurgles and bubbles against it. Men observed this, and devised, in accordance with this property of the two elements, a way of introducing air to work their mechanism. They made a cavity of some hard stuff, and prevented the air in it from escaping in any direction, and then introduced water into this cavity through its mouth, apportioning the quantity of water according to requirement. Next, they allowed an exit in the opposite direction to the air, so that it passed into a pipe placed ready to hand, and in so doing, being violently constrained by the water, became a blast. And this, playing on the structure of the pipe, produced a note. Is it not clearly proved by such visible results that there is a mind of some kind in man? something other than that which is visible, which by virtue of an invisible thinking nature of its own, first prepares by inward invention such devices, and then, when they have been so matured, brings them to the light and exhibits them in the subservient matter. For if it were possible to ascribe such wonders, as the theory of our opponents does, to the actual con constitution of the elements, why, we should have these mechanisms building themselves spontaneously. The bronze would not wait for the artist to be made into the likeness of a man, but would become such by an innate force. The air would not require the pipe to make a note, but would sound spontaneously by its own fortuitous flux and motion and the jet of the water upwards would not be as it now is the result of an artificial pressure forcing it to move in an unnatural direction, but the water would rise into the mechanism of its own accord, finding in that direction a natural channel. But if none of these results are produced spontaneously by elemental force, but on the contrary each element is employed at will by artifice, and if artifice is a kind of movement and activity of mind, will not the very consequences of what has been urged by way of objection show us mind as something other than the thing perceived? That the thing perceived, I replied, is not the same as the thing not perceived, I grant. But I do not discover any answer to our question in such a statement. It is not yet clear to me what we are to think that thing not perceived to be. All I have been shown by your argument is that it is not anything material, and I do not yet know the fitting name for it. I wanted especially to know what it is, not what it is not. We do learn, she replied, much about many things by this very same method, inasmuch as in the very act of saying a thing is not so-and-so, we, by implication, interpret the very nature of the thing in question. For instance, when we say guileless, we indicate a good man, 
When we say unmanly, we have expressed the idea that the man is a coward. And it is possible to suggest a great many things in like fashion, wherein we either convey the idea of goodness by the negation of badness, or vice versa. Well then, if one thinks so, with regard to the matter now before us, one will not fail to gain a proper conception of it. The question is, what are we to think of mind in its very essence? Now, granted that the inquirer has had his doubts set at rest as to the existence of the thing in question, owing to the activities which it displays to us, and only wants to know what it is, he will have adequately discovered it by being told that it is not that which our senses perceive, neither a color, nor a form, nor a hardness, nor a weight, nor a quantity, nor a cubic dimension, nor a point, nor anything else perceptible in matter. Supposing, that is, that there does exist a something beyond all these. Here I interrupted her discourse. If you leave all these out of the account, I do not see how you can possibly avoid cancelling along with them the very thing which you are in search of. I cannot at present conceive to what, as apart from these, the perceptive activity is to cling. For on all occasions in investigating with the scrutinizing intellect the contents of the world, we must, so far as we put our hand at all on what we are seeking, inevitably touch, as blind men feeling along the walls for the door, some one of the things aforesaid. We must come on color, or form, or quantity, or something else on your list. And when it comes to saying that the thing is none of them, our feebleness of mind induces us to suppose that it does not exist at all. Shame on such absurdity, said she, indignantly interrupting. A fine conclusion this narrow-minded, groveling view of the world brings us to. If all that is not cognizable by sense is to be wiped out of existence, the all-embracing power that presides over things is admitted by this same assertion not to be. Once a man has been told about the non-material and invisible nature of the deity, he must perforce with such a premise reckon it as absolutely non-existent. If, on the other hand, the absence of such characteristics, in his case, does not constitute any limitation on his existence, how can the mind of man be squeezed out of existence along with this withdrawal, one by one, of each property of matter? Well then, I retorted, we only exchange one paradox for another in arguing in this way. For our reason will be reduced to the conclusion that the deity and the mind of man are identical if it be true that neither can be thought of except by the withdrawal of all the data of sense. Say not so, she replied. To talk so also is blasphemous. Rather, as the scripture tells you, say that the one is like the other. For that which is made in the image of the deity necessarily possesses a likeness to its prototype in every respect. It resembles it in being intellectual, immaterial, unconnected with any notion of weight, and in eluding any measurement of its dimensions. Yet, as regards its own peculiar nature, it is something different from that other. Indeed, it would no longer be an image if it were altogether identical with that other. But where we have a big letter alpha in that uncreate prototype, we have a little letter alpha in the image. Just as in a minute particle of glass, when it happens to face the light, the complete disk of the sun is often to be seen, not represented thereon in proportion to its proper size, but so far as the minuteness of the particle admits of its being represented at all. 
thus do the reflections of those ineffable qualities of deity shine forth within the narrow limits of our nature. And so our reason, following the lead of these reflections, will not miss grasping the mind in its essence by clearing away from the question all corporeal qualities. Nor, on the other hand, will it bring the pure and infinite existence to the level of that which is perishable and little. It will regard this essence of the mind as an object of thought only, since it is the image of an existence which is such. But it will not pronounce this image to be identical with the prototype. Just then, as we have no doubts owing to the display of a divine, mysterious wisdom in the universe, about a divine being and a divine power existing in it all, which secures its continuance. Though, if you required a definition of that being, you would therein find the deity completely sundered from every object in creation, whether of sense or thought, while in these last two, natural distinctions are admitted. So, too, there is nothing strange in the soul's separate existence as a substance, whatever we may think that substance to be, being no hindrance to her actual existence, in spite of the elemental atoms of the world not harmonizing with her in the definition of her being. In the case of our living bodies, composed as they are from the blending of these atoms, there is no sort of communion as has been just said, on the score of substance, between the simplicity and invisibility of the soul and the grossness of those bodies. But notwithstanding that, there is not a doubt that there is in them the soul's vivifying influence exerted by a law which it is beyond the human understanding to comprehend. Not even, then, when those atoms have again been dissolved into themselves has that bond of a vivifying influence vanished. But as while the framework of the body still holds together, each individual part is possessed of a soul which penetrates equally every component member, and one could not call that soul hard and resistant, though blended with the solid, nor humid or cold, or the reverse though it transmits life to all and each of such parts. So when that framework is dissolved and has returned to its kindred elements, there is nothing against probability that that simple and incomposite essence, which has once for all, by some inexplicable law, grown with the growth of the bodily framework, should continually remain beside the atoms with which it has been blended and should in no way be sundered from a union once formed. For it does not follow that because the composite is dissolved, the incomposite must be dissolved with it. That those atoms, I rejoined, should unite and again be separated, and that this constitutes the formation and dissolution of the body, no one would deny. But we have to consider this. There are great intervals between these atoms. They differ from each other both in position and also in qualitative distinctions and peculiarities. When indeed these atoms have all converged upon the given subject, it is reasonable that that intelligent and undimensional essence which we call the soul should cohere with that which is so united. But once these atoms are separated from each other, and have gone whither their nature impels them, what is to become of the soul when her vessel is thus scattered in many directions? As a sailor, when his ship has been wrecked and gone to pieces, cannot float upon all the pieces at once which have been scattered this way and that over the surface of the sea. For he seizes any bit that comes to hand and lets all the rest drift away. In the same way, the soul, being by nature 
incapable of dissolution along with the atoms, will, if she finds it hard to be parted from the body altogether, cling to some one of them. And if we take this view, consistency will no more allow us to regard her as immortal for living in one atom than as mortal for not living in a number of them. But the intelligent and undimensional, she replied, is neither contracted nor diffused. Contraction and diffusion being a property of body only. But by virtue of a nature which is formless and bodiless, it is present with the body equally in the contraction and in the diffusion of its atoms. And it is no more narrowed by the compression which attends the uniting of the atoms than it is abandoned by them when they wander off to their kindred. However wide the interval is held to be which we observe between alien atoms, for instance, there is a great difference between the buoyant and light, as contrasted with the heavy and solid, between the hot, as contrasted with the cold, between the humid, as contrasted with its opposite. Nevertheless, it is no strain to an intelligent essence to be present in each of those elements to which it has once cohered. This blending with opposites does not split it up. In locality, in peculiar qualities, these elemental atoms are held to be far removed from each other. But an undimensional nature finds it no labor to cling to what is locally divided, seeing that even now it is possible for the mind at once to contemplate the heavens above us and to extend its busy scrutiny beyond the horizon. Nor is its contemplative power at all distracted by these excursions into distances so great. There is nothing, then, to hinder the soul's presence in the body's atoms, whether fused in union or decomposed in dissolution. Just as in the amalgam of gold and silver, a certain methodical force is to be observed which has fused the metals, and if the one be afterwards smelted out of the other, the law of this method, nevertheless, continues to reside in each, so that while the amalgam is separated, this method does not suffer division along with it. For you cannot make fractions out of the indivisible, in the same way, this intelligent essence of the soul is observable in the concourse of the atoms and does not undergo division when they are dissolved. But it remains with them, and even in their separation is coextensive with them, yet not itself dissevered nor discounted into sections to accord with the number of the atoms. Such a condition belongs to the material and spatial world, but that which is intelligent and undimensional is not liable to the circumstances of space. Therefore the soul exists in the actual atoms which she has once animated, and there is no force to tear her away from her cohesion with them. What cause for melancholy, then, is there herein? that the visible is exchanged for the invisible. And why is it that your mind has conceived such a hatred of death? Upon this, I recurred to the definition which she had previously given of the soul. And I said that, to my thinking, her definition had not indicated distinctly enough all the powers of the soul, which are a matter of observation. It declares the soul to be an intellectual essence which imparts to the organic body a force of life by which the senses operate. Now the soul is not thus operative only in our scientific and speculative intellect. It does not produce results in that world only or employ the organs of sense only 
for this their natural work. On the contrary, we observe in our nature many emotions of desire and many of anger, and both these exist in us as qualities of our kind. And we see both of them in their manifestations, displaying further many most subtle differences. There are many states, for instance, which are occasioned by desire, many others which, on the other hand, proceed from anger, and none of them are of the body. But that which is not of the body is plainly intellectual. Now, our definition exhibits the soul as something intellectual, so that one of two alternatives, both absurd, must emerge when we follow out this view to the end. Either anger and desire are both second souls in us, and a plurality of souls must take the place of the single soul. Or the thinking faculty in us cannot be regarded as a soul either, if they are not. The intellectual element adhering equally to all of them and stamping them all as souls, or else excluding every one of them equally from the specific qualities of soul. You are quite justified, she replied, in raising this question, and it has before this been discussed by many elsewhere. Namely, what we are to think of the principle of desire and the principle of anger within us. Are they consubstantial with the soul, inherent in the soul's very self from her first organization? Or are they something different, accruing to us afterwards? In fact, while all equally allow that these principles are to be detected in the soul, investigation has not yet discovered exactly what we are to think of them, so as to gain some fixed belief with regard to them. The generality of men still fluctuate in their opinions about this, which are as erroneous as they are numerous. As for ourselves, if the Gentile philosophy, which deals methodically with all these points, were really adequate for a demonstration, it would certainly be superfluous to add a discussion on the soul to those speculations. But while the latter proceeded on the subject of the soul, as far in the direction of supposed consequences as the thinker pleased, we are not entitled to such license. I mean, that of affirming whatever we please. We make the Holy Scriptures the rule and the measure of every tenet. We necessarily fix our eyes upon that, and approve that alone, which may be made to harmonize with the intention of those writings. We must therefore neglect the platonic chariot and the pair of horses of dissimilar forces yoked to it, and their driver, whereby the philosopher allegorizes these facts about the soul. We must neglect also all that is said by the philosopher who succeeded him, and who followed out probabilities by rules of art, and diligently investigated the very question now before us, declaring that the soul was mortal by reason of these two principles. We must neglect all, before and since their time, whether they philosophized in prose or in verse. And we will adopt, as the guide of our reasoning, the scripture, which lays it down as an axiom that there is no excellence in the soul, which is not a property as well of the divine nature. For he who declares the soul to be God's likeness asserts that anything foreign to him is outside the limits of the soul. Similarity cannot be retained in those qualities which are diverse from the original. Since then, nothing of the kind we are considering is included in the conception of the divine nature, 
one would be reasonable in surmising that such things are not consubstantial with the soul either. Now, to seek to build up our doctrine by rule of dialectic and the knowledge which draws and destroys conclusions involves a species of discussion which we shall ask to be excused from as being a weak and questionable way of demonstrating truth. Indeed, it is clear to everyone that that subtle dialectic possesses a force that may be turned both ways, as well as for the overthrow of truth as for the detection of falsehood. And so we begin to suspect even truth itself when it is advanced in company with such a kind of artifice, and to think that the very ingenuity of it is trying to bias our judgment and upset the truth. If, on the other hand, anyone will accept a discussion which is in a naked, unsyllogistic form, we will speak upon these points by making our study of them so far as we can follow the chain of scriptural tradition. What is it, then, that we assert? We say that the fact of the reasoning animal man being capable of understanding and knowing is most surely attested by those outside our faith, and that this definition would never have sketched our nature so if it had viewed anger and desire and all such like emotions as consubstantial with that nature. In any other case, one would not give a definition of the subject in hand by putting a generic instead of a specific quality. And so, as the principle of desire and the principle of anger are observed equally in rational and irrational natures, one could not rightly mark the specific quality by means of this generic one. But how can that which, in defining a nature, is superfluous and worthy of exclusion, be treated as a part of that nature, and so available for falsifying that definition? Every definition of an essence looks to the specific quality of the subject in hand, and whatever is outside that speciality is set aside as having nothing to do with the required definition. Yet beyond question, these faculties of anger and desire are allowed to be common to all reasoning and brute natures. Anything common is not identical with that which is peculiar. It is imperative, therefore, that we should not range these faculties among those whereby humanity is exclusively meant. But, just as one may perceive the principle of sensation and that of nutrition and growth in man, and yet not shake thereby the given definition of his soul, for the quality A being in the soul does not prevent the quality B being in it too. So, when one detects in humanity these emotions of anger and desire, one cannot on that account fairly quarrel with the definition, as if it fell short of a full indication of man's nature. What then, I asked the teacher, are we to think about this? For I cannot yet see how we can fitly repudiate faculties which are actually within us. You see, she replied, there is a battle of the reason with them, and a struggle to rid the soul of them. And there are men in whom this struggle has ended in success. It was so with Moses, as we know. He was superior both to anger and desire. History testifying of him in both respects, that he was meek beyond all men, and by meekness it indicates the absence of all anger, 
and a mind quite devoid of resentment, and that he desired none of those things about which we see the desiring faculty, in the generality, so active. This could not have been so if these faculties were nature and were referable to the contents of man's essence. For it is impossible for one who has come quite outside his nature to be in existence at all. But if Moses was at one and the same time in existence and not in these conditions, then it follows that these conditions are something other than nature and not nature itself. For if on the one hand, that is truly nature in which the essence of the being is found. And on the other, the removal of these conditions is in our power, so that their removal not only does no harm, but is even beneficial to our nature. It is clear that these conditions are to be numbered among externals, and are affections rather than the essence of the nature. For the essence is that thing only which it is. As for anger, most think it a fermenting of the blood around the heart, others an eagerness to inflict pain in return for other pain. We would take it to be the impulse to hurt one who has provoked us. But none of these accounts of it tally with the definition of the soul. Again, if we were to define what desire is in itself, we should call it a seeking for that which is wanting, or a longing for pre pleasurable enjoyment, or a pain at not possessing that upon which the heart is set, or a state with regard to some pleasure which there is no opportunity of enjoying. These and similar descriptions all indicate desire, but they have no connection with the definition of the soul. But it is so with regard to all those other conditions also, which we see to have some relation to the soul. Those, I mean, which are mutually opposed to each other such as cowardice and courage, pleasure and pain, fear and contempt, and so on. Each of them seems akin to the principle of desire or that of anger, while they have a separate definition to mark their own peculiar nature. Courage and contempt, for instance, exhibit a certain phase of the irascible impulse, the dispositions arising from cowardice and fear exhibit, on the other hand, a diminution and weakening of that same impulse. Pain, again, draws its material both from anger and desire. For the impotence of anger, which consists in not being able to punish one who is first given pain, becomes itself pain and that despair of getting objects of desire and the absence of things upon which the heart is set create in the mind the same solemn state. Moreover, the opposite to pain, I mean the sensation of pleasure, like pain, divides itself between anger and desire, for pleasure is the leading motive of them both. All these conditions, I say, have some relation to the soul, and yet they are not the soul, but only like warts growing out of the soul's thinking part, which are reckoned as part of it because they adhere to it, and yet are not that actual thing which the soul is in its essence. And yet, I rejoined to the Virgin, we see no slight help afforded for improvement to the virtuous from all these conditions. Daniel's desire was his glory, and Phineas's anger pleased the deity. We have been told, too, that fear is the beginning of wisdom, 
and learned from Paul that salvation is the goal of the sorrow after a godly sort. The gospel bids us have contempt for danger, and the not being afraid with any amazement is nothing else but a description of courage. And this last is numbered by wisdom among the things that are good. In all this, scripture shows that such emotional conditions are not to be considered weaknesses. Weaknesses would not have been so employed for putting virtue into practice. I think, replied the teacher, that I am myself responsible for this confusion arising from different accounts of the matter, for I did not state it as distinctly as I might have by introducing a certain order of consequences for our consideration. Now, however, some such order shall, as far as it is possible, be devised, so that our essay may advance in the way of logical sequence, and so give no room for such contradictions. We declare, then, that the speculative, critical, and world-surveying faculty of the soul is its peculiar property by virtue of its very nature, and that thereby the soul preserves within itself the image of the divine grace, since our reason surmises that divinity itself, whatever it may be in its inmost nature, is manifested in these very things, universal supervision and the critical discernment between good and evil. But all those elements of the soul which lie on the borderland and are capable from their peculiar nature of inclining to either of two opposites, whose eventual determination to the good or to the bad depends on the kind of use they are put to. Anger, for instance, and fear, and any other such like emotion of the soul, divested of which human nature cannot be studied. All these we reckon as accretions from without, because in the beauty, which is man's prototype, no such characteristics are to be found. Now, let the following statement be offered as a mere exercise in interpretation. I pray that it may escape the sneers of caviling hearers. Scripture informs us that the deity, preceded by a sort of graduated and ordered advance to the creation of man, after the foundations of the universe were laid, as history records, man did not appear on the earth at once, but the creation of the brutes preceded his, and the plants preceded them. Thereby scripture shows that the vital forces blended with the world of matter according to a gradation. First, it infused itself into insensate nature, and in continuation of this, advanced into the sentient world, and then ascended to intelligent and rational beings. Accordingly, while all existing things must either be corporeal or spiritual, the former are divided into the animate and inanimate. By animate, I mean possessed of life. And of things possessed of life, some have it with sensation, sentient, the rest have no sensation. Again, of these sentient things, some have reason, the rest have not. Seeing then that this life of sensation could not possibly exist apart from the matter which is the subject of it, and the intellectual life could not be embodied either without growing in the sentient, on this account the creation of man is related as coming last as of one who took up into himself every single form of life, both that of plants and that which is seen in brutes, 
His nourishment and growth he derives from vegetable life. For even in vegetables, such processes are to be seen when nourishment is being drawn in by their roots and given off in fruit and leaves. His sentient organization he derives from the brute creation. But his faculty of thought and reason is incommunicable and is a peculiar gift in our nature to be considered by itself. However, just as this nature has the instinct acquisitive of the necessaries to material existence, an instinct which, when manifested in us men, we call appetite, and as we admit this appertains to the vegetable form of life, since we can notice it there too, like so many impulses working naturally to satisfy themselves with their kindred aliment and to issue in germination. So all the peculiar conditions of the brute creation are blended with the intellectual part of the soul. To them, she continued, belongs anger. To them belongs fear. To them all those other opposing activities within us, everything except the faculty of reason and thought. That alone, the choice product, as has been said, of all our life, bears the stamp of the divine character. But since, according to the view which we have just enunciated, it is not possible for this reasoning faculty to exist in the life of the body without existing by means of sensations, and since sensation is already found subsisting in the brute creation, necessarily, as it were, by reason of this one condition, our soul has touch with the other things which are knit up with it, and these are all those phenomena within us which we call passions, which have not been allotted to human nature for any bad purpose at all, for the Creator would most certainly be the author of evil if, so deeply rooted as they are in our nature, any necessities of wrongdoing were found in them but according to the use which our free will puts them to. These emotions of the soul become the instruments of virtue or vice. They are like the iron which is being fashioned according to the volition of the artificer and receives whatever shape the idea which is in his mind prescribes and becomes a sword or some agricultural implement supposing then that our reason which is our nature's choicest part holds the dominion over these imported emotions as scripture allegorically declares in the command to men to rule over the brutes none of them will be active in the ministry of evil fear will only generate within us obedience and anger fortitude and cowardice, caution, and the instinct of desire will procure for us the delight that is divine and perfect. But if reason drops the reins and is dragged behind like a charioteer who has got entangled in his chariot, then these instincts are changed into fierceness, just as we see happen among the brutes. For since reason does not preside over the natural impulses that are implanted in them, the more irascible animals, under the generalship of their anger, mutually destroy each other, while the bulky and powerful animals get no good themselves from their strength, but become by their want of reason slaves of that which has reason. Neither are the activities of their desire for pleasure employed on any of the higher objects, nor does any other instinct to be observed in them result in any profit for themselves. 
with us too with ourselves, if these instincts are not turned by reasoning into the right direction, and if our feelings get the mastery of our mind, the man is changed from a reasoning into an unreasoning being, and from godlike intelligence sinks by the force of these passions to the level of the brute. Much moved by these words, I said, To anyone who reflects, indeed, your exposition, advancing as it does in this consecutive manner, though plain and unvarnished, bears sufficiently upon it the stamp of correctness and hits the truth. And to those who are expert only in the technical methods of proof, a mere demonstration suffices to convince. But as for ourselves, we were agreed that there is something more trustworthy than any of these artificial conclusions, namely, that that which the teachings of Holy Scripture point to. And so I deem that it is necessary to inquire, in addition to what has been said, whether this inspired teaching harmonizes with it all. And who, she replied, could deny that truth is to be found only in that upon which the seal of scriptural testimony is set? So, if it is necessary that something from the Gospels should be adduced in support of our view, a study of the parable of the wheat and the tares will not be out of place here. The householder there sowed good seed, and we are plainly the house. But the enemy, having watched for the time when men slept, sowed that which was useless in that which was good for food setting the tares in the very middle of the wheat. The two kinds of seed grew up together, for it was not possible that seed put into the very middle of the wheat should fail to grow up with it. But the superintendent of the field forbids the servants to gather up the useless crop on account of their growing at the very root of the opposite sort so as not to root up the nutritious along with that foreign growth. Now, we think that scripture means by the good seed the corresponding impulses of the soul, each one of which, if only they are cultivated for good, necessarily will put forth the fruit of virtue within us. But since there has been scattered among these the bad seed of the error of judgment as to the true beauty, which is alone in its intrinsic nature such, and since this last has been thrown into the shade by the growth of delusion which springs up along with it, for the active principle of desire does not germinate and increase in the direction of that natural beauty which was the object of its being sown in us. But it has changed its growth so as to move toward a bestial and unthinking state. This very error as to beauty carrying its impulse toward its result. And in the same way, the seed of anger does not steel us to be brave, but only arms us to fight with our own people and the power of loving deserts its intellectual objects and becomes completely crazy for the immoderate enjoyment of the pleasures of sense. And so, in like manner, our other affections put forth the worse instead of the better growths. On account of this, the wise husbandman leaves this growth that has been introduced among his seed to remain there, so as to secure our not being altogether stripped of better hopes by desire having been rooted out along with that good-for-nothing growth. If our nature suffered such a mutilation, what would there be to lift us up to grasp the heavenly delights? 
if love is taken from us, how shall we be united to God? If anger is to be extinguished, what arms shall we possess against the adversary? Therefore, the husbandman leaves those bastard seeds within us, not for them always to overwhelm the more precious crop, but in order that the land itself, for so in his allegory he calls the heart, by its native inherent power, which is that of reasoning, may wither up the one growth and may render the other fruitful and abundant. But if that is not done, then he commissions the fire to mark the distinction in the crops. If, then, a man indulges these affections in a due proportion and holds them in his own power instead of being held in theirs, employing them for an instrument as a king does his subjects' many hands, then efforts toward excellence more easily succeed for him. But should he become their property, and as would any slaves mutiny against their master, gets enslaved by those slavish thoughts, and ignominiously bows before them, a prey to his natural inferiors, he will be forced to turn to those employments which his imperious masters command. This being so, we shall not pronounce these emotions of the soul, which lie in the power of their possessors, for good or for ill, to be either a virtue or a vice. But, whenever their impulse is towards what is noble, then they become matter for praise, as his desire did for Daniel, and his anger for Phineas, and their grief to those who nobly mourn. But if they incline toward baseness, then these are and are called bad passions. She ceased after this statement and allowed the discussion a short interval in which I reviewed mentally all that had been said. I reviewed mentally all that had been said and reverting to that former course of proof in her discourse, that it was not impossible that the soul, after the body's dissolution, should reside in its atoms, I again addressed her. Where is that much talked of and renowned Hades, then? The word is in frequent circulation, both in the intercourse of daily life and in the writings of the heathens and in our own and all think that into it, as into a place of safekeeping, souls migrate from here. Surely you would not call your Adams that Hades. Clearly, replied the teacher, you have not quite attended to the argument. In speaking of the soul's migration from the seen to the unseen, I thought I had omitted nothing as regards the question about Hades. It seems to me that whether in the heathen or in the divine writings, this word for a place in which souls are said to be means nothing else but a transition to that unseen world of which we have no glimpse. And how then, I asked, is it that some think that by the underworld is meant an actual place? and that it harbors within itself the souls that have at last flitted away from human life, drawing them towards itself as the right receptacle for such natures. Well, replied the teacher, our doctrine will be in no ways injured by such a supposition, for if it is true what you say, and also that the vault of heaven prolongs itself so uninterruptedly that it encircles all things with itself, and that the earth and its surroundings are poised in the middle, and that the motion of all the revolving bodies is round this fixed and solid center, then I say there is an absolute necessity that whatever may happen to each one of the atoms on the upper side of the earth, the same will happen on the opposite side, 
seeing that one single substance encompasses its entire bulk. As when the sun shines above the earth, the shadow is spread over its lower part, because its spherical shape makes it impossible to be clasped all around at one and the same time by the rays. And necessarily, on whatever side the sun's rays may fall on some particular part of the globe, if we follow a straight diameter, we will find a shadow upon the opposite point. And so continuously, at the opposite end of the direct line of the rays, shadow moves round that globe, keeping pace with the sun. So that equally, in their turn, both the upper half and under half of the earth are in light and darkness. So by this analogy, we have reason to be certain that whatever in our hemisphere is observed to befall the atoms, the same will befall them in that other hemisphere. The environment of the atoms being one and the same on every side of the earth, I deem it right neither to contradict nor yet favor those who raise the objection that we must regard either this or the lower region as assigned to the souls released. <laughs> as long as this objection does not shake our central doctrine of the existence of those souls after the life in the flesh, there need be no controversy about the whereabouts to our mind, holding as we do that place is a property of body only, and that soul, being immaterial, is by no necessity of its nature detained in any place. But what, I asked, if your opponent should shield himself behind the apostle, Paul, where he says that every reasoning creature in the restitution of all things is to look toward him who presides over the whole. In that passage in the epistle to the Philippians, he makes mention of certain things that are under the earth. Every knee shall bow to him of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. We shall stand by our doctrine, answered the teacher, even if we should hear them adducing these words. For the existence of the soul after death, we have the assent of our opponent, and so we do not make an objection as to the place, as we have just said. But if some were to ask the meaning of the Apostle in this utterance, what is one to say? Would you remove all signification of place from the passage? I do not think, she replied, that the Divine Apostle divided the intellectual world into localities when he named part as in heaven, part as on earth, and part as under the earth. There are three states in which reasoning creatures can be. One, from the very first, received an immaterial life, and we call it the angelic. Another is in union with the flesh, and we call it the human. A third is released by death from fleshy entanglements, and it is to be found in souls pure and simple. Now, I think that the Divine Apostle, in his deep wisdom, looked to this when he revealed the future concord of all these reasoning beings in the work of goodness, and that he puts the unembodied angel world in heaven, and that still involved with the body on earth, and that released from the body under the earth. Or indeed, if there is any other world to be classed under that which is possessed of reason, it is not left out. And whether anyone choose to call this last demons or spirits or anything else of the kind, we shall not care. We certainly believe, both because of the prevailing opinion and still more of Scripture's teaching, that there exists another world of beings besides, divested of such bodies as ours are, who are opposed to that which is good, and are capable of hurting the lives of men, having by an act of will lapsed from the nobler view. 
and by this revolt from goodness personified in themselves, the contrary principle. And this world is what some say the apostle adds to the number of the things under the earth, signifying in that passage that when evil shall have been some day annihilated in the long revolutions of the ages, nothing shall be left outside the world of goodness, but that even from those evil spirits shall rise in harmony the confession of Christ's lordship. If this is so, then no one can compel us to see any spot of the underworld in the expression, things under the earth. The atmosphere spreads equally over every part of the earth, and there is not a single corner of it left unrobed by this circumambient air. When she had finished, I hesitated a moment, and then said, I am not yet satisfied about the thing which we have been inquiring into. After all that has been said, my mind is still in doubt, and I beg that our discussion may be allowed to revert to the same line of reasoning as before, omitting only that upon which we are thoroughly agreed. I say this, for I think that all but the most stubborn controversialists will have been sufficiently convinced by our debate not to consign the soul after the body's dissolution to annihilation and non-entity, nor to argue that because it differs substantially from the atoms, it is impossible for it to exist anywhere in the universe. For however much a being that is intellectual and immaterial may fail to coincide with these atoms, it is in no way hindered, so far, from existing in them. And this belief of ours rests on two facts. Firstly, on the souls existing in our bodies in this present life, though fundamentally different from them. And secondly, on the fact that the divine being, as our argument has shown, though distinctly something other than visible and material substances, nevertheless pervades each one among all existences, and by this penetration of the whole, keeps the world in a state of being. So that following these analogies, we need not think that the soul either is out of existence when she passes from the world of forms to the unseen. But how, I insisted, after the united whole of the atoms has assumed, owing to their mixing together, a form quite different, the form, in fact, with which the soul has been actually domesticated, by what mark, when this form, as we should have expected, is effaced, along with the resolution of the atoms, shall the soul follow along them, now that the familiar form ceases to persist. She waited a moment, and then said, Give me leave to invent a fanciful simile in order to illustrate the matter before us, even though that which I suppose may be outside the realm of possibility. Grant it possible, then, in the art of painting, not only to mix opposite colors, as painters are always doing, to represent a particular tint, but also to separate again the same mixture and restore to each of the colors its natural dye. If then, white or black or red or golden color or any other color that has been mixed to form the given tint were to be again separated from that union with another and remain by itself, we suppose that our artist will nonetheless remember the actual nature of that color and that in no case will he show forgetfulness, either of the red, for instance, or the black, if, after having become quite a different color by composition with each other, they each return to their natural dye. We suppose, I say, that our artist 
remembers the manner of the mutual blending of these colors, and so knows what sort of color was mixed with a given color, and what sort of color was the result, and how the other color being ejected from the composition, the original color, in consequence of such release, resumed its own peculiar hue. And supposing it were required to produce the same result again by composition, the process will be all the easier from having been already practiced in his previous work. Now, if reason can see any analogy in this simile, we must search the matter in hand by its light. Let the soul stand for this art of the painter, and let the natural atoms stand for the colors of his art, and let the mixture of that tint compounded of the various dyes, and the return of these to their native state, which we have been allowed to assume, res represent respectively the concourse and the separation of the atoms. Then, as we assume in the simile, that the painter's art tells him the actual dye of each color when it has returned after mixing to its proper hue, so that he has an exact knowledge of the red and of the black and of any other color that went to form the required tint by a specific way of uniting with another kind. A knowledge which includes its appearance both in the mixture and now when it is in its natural state and in the future again, supposing all the colors were mixed over again in like fashion. So, we assert, does the soul know the natural peculiarities of those atoms whose concourse makes the frame of the body in which it has itself grown, even after the scattering of those atoms? However far from each other their natural propensity and their inherent forces of repulsion urge them, and debar each from mingling with its opposite, nonetheless will the soul be near each by its power of recognition, and will persistently cling to the familiar atoms until their concourse after this division again takes place in the same way. For that fresh formation of the dissolved body, which will properly be and be called resurrection. You seem, I interrupted, in this passing remark, to have made an excellent defense of the faith in the resurrection. By it, I think, the opponents of this doctrine might be gradually led to consider it not a thing absolutely impossible that the atoms should again coalesce and form the same man as before. That is very true, the teacher replied, for we may hear these opponents urging the following difficulty. The atoms are resolved like to like into the universe. By what device then does the warmth, for instance, residing in such and such a man, after joining the universal warmth, again dissociate itself from this connection with its kindred, so as to form this man who is being remolded. For if the identical individual particle does not return, and only something that is homogeneous but not identical is fetched, you will have something else in the place of that first thing, and such a process will cease to be a resurrection and will merely be the creation of a new man. But if the same man is to return into himself, he must be the same entirely, and regain his original formation in every single atom of the elements. Then to meet such an objection, I rejoined, the above opinion about the soul will, as I said, avail. Namely, that she remains after dissolution in those very atoms in which she first grew up, and, like a guardian placed over private property, does not abandon them when they are mingled with their kindred atoms, and by the subtle ubiquity of her intelligence makes no mistake about them, with all their subtle minuteness, but diffuses herself along with those which belong to herself when they are being mingled with their kindred dust, and suffers no exhaustion in keeping up with the whole number of them when they stream back into the universe 
but remains with them. No matter in what direction or what fashion, nature may arrange them. But should the signal be given by the all-disposing power for these scattered atoms to combine again, then just as when every one of the various ra ropes that hang from one block answer at one and the same moment to the pull from that center, so following this force of the soul which acts upon the various atoms, all these, once so familiar with each other, rush simultaneously together and form the cable of the body by means of the soul, each single one of them being wedded to its former neighbor and embracing an old acquaintance. The following illustration also, the teacher went on, might be very properly added to those already brought forward to show that the soul has not need of much teaching in order to distinguish its own from the alien among the atoms. Imagine a potter with a supply of clay, and let the supply be a large one, and let part of it already have been molded to form finished vessels, while the rest is still waiting to be molded. And suppose the vessels themselves not to be all of similar shape, but one to be a jug, for instance, and another a wine jar, another a plate, another a cup, or any other useful vessel. And further, let not one owner possess them all, but let us fancy for each a special owner. Now, as long as these vessels are unbroken, they are, of course, recognizable by their owners, and none the less so, even should they be broken in pieces. For from those pieces, each will know, for instance, that this belongs to a jar. And again, what sort of fragment belongs to a cup? And if they are plunged again into the unworked clay, the discernment between what has been already worked and that clay will be a more unerring one still. The individual man is as such a vessel. He has been molded out of the universal matter owing to the concourse of his atoms, and he exhibits in a form peculiarly his own a marked distinction from his kind. And when that form has gone to pieces, the soul that has been mistress of this particular vessel will have an exact knowledge of it derived even from its fragments. Nor will she leave this property either in the common blending with all the other fragments. Or, if it be plunged into the still formless part of the matter from which the atoms have come, she always remembers her own as it was when compact in bodily form. And after dissolution, she never makes any mistake about it, led by marks still clinging to the remains. I applauded this as well devised to bring out the natural features of the case before us.